there. Hello, oh, how's there it we going? Go. Good evening. Brothers from a different mother. Mm. <laughs> That's definitely <right>. bad. <laughs> uh, we've got a, we've got the same accents too, so you've got to excuse us. Oh, oh, yes. We're cricket competitors oh. with you, but yeah, yeah. it's going to be a tough oh, conversation, God. man. Oh, God. <laughs> give me, give, give, me Ra- give me Rabada. Give me Rabada. I want it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I follow cricket everywhere, every match, except maybe <laughs> even Zimbabwe, I'll fall to. Fall wow. <laughs> That's impressive. My favorite sign ever, like ever, my favorite banner at a cricket match was when we had first come back uh, into the World Cup. I think it was 1990. I think we played in 1992 in the World Cup, actually, in Australia. And the banner in the crowd said, South Africa, unbeaten, 1971 to 19, <laughs> 1992. I was like, yeah. That was, that was <laughs> so we, we're testing out, a new, um, testing out a new recording device today as well. So the first time for you today, Safwan. So we'll see how that works. <laughs> Waking at dawn. So we are here with Safwan Shah. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Well, thank you to you. I'm excited to be here. Beautiful. Yeah. It's actually 9 p.m. there in California where you are. And uh, that was actually not a problem at all for you, as you mentioned when we were chatting before, which is amazing. So thanks for making the time to chat to us. Indeed. Night is still young. Yeah, I, I, I had to message Craig last night. I was like, Craig, are you sure at 9 p.m.? Like, you know, it's quite late. <laughs> but yeah, obviously you're a night owl, which is cool. <laughs> so, Safwan, so, so your journey to becoming a sort of a set, successful entrepreneur is rather unique and interesting. And uh, so let's start off by hearing about the days long before Silicon Valley, uh, when uh, your dad, your granddad were both engineers your mom is an artist, your uncles were all engineers, your sisters are both highly successful women. So it sounds like the pressure was on at home growing up. How, how was that time? <laughs> yes, exactly. I was the dumbest of the family. So, <laughs> kind of, because yes, there was, I wouldn't call it pressure. The inspiration was all around me and uh, the path had been paved by others. So that was pretty cool. It's not that, you know, I can't say that I was the first one who went to college in my family and that's kind of a nice story, but I can't claim that privilege. Everyone did better than me and then I had to follow in their footsteps. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's nice having that, those sort of people to look up to, I think, in, in life and give us some sort of direction. Yeah, in retrospect, it's nice. But when you're living through it, it is... <laughs> kind of challenging at times and you say really I can never be like that person I mean they're so brilliant or they're so good and and you're young you're in you know whatever sixth grade tenth grade twelfth grade that's when you start noticing your own failings right when you're very young you're perfect it's only <laughs> when you become a little older that you say I really I was perfect <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where you say how, how do I become like that person you know, people with PhDs or accomplished in their field inventors whatever so it is challenging yeah Yeah, for sure and and you obviously you grew up in pakistan and your family moved around a lot from town to town because you said that your dad was too honest so maybe (laughs) you can tell us about that that's what um, you know it it is uh, actually my dad passed away in december three months uh, ago and um I've had uh, you know many conversations with him about those days, and I remember them very you know, well. Uh, my my father uh, was an electrical engineer, and he ran the electrical board or system across the country. And there are many provinces in Pakistan that are different provinces. So there are these engineers who kind of go to different cities, whether building dams and so on and so forth. So he would. Uh, regularly get transferred because um, he was honest <laughs> and in, in, in a system where you know, sometimes it's a bit, there is corruption and people get paid to put electrical connections and so on and forth, so forth. So he was someone who didn't do that. Every couple of years, he would get into the wrong side of somebody and then he would be transferred and replaced with a more sort of pliable officer. 
<laughs> so, so I had to change schools with my first 10 years. Uh, gosh, at least six, seven, eight schools that I went to in different cities of the country. And sure. um, it was quite, a, quite an experience because I mean, I, uh, and I went to these Catholic schools. So the, my schools that I went to were Sacred Heart, St. Mary's, mm. um, uh, Grammar School, which was St. Francis, and St. Francis Grammar School, and uh, St. Bonaventures, and, um, and so on. It's, these are my schools. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it, it was a fantastic experience. My mother would just hold my hand and take me, take me to a new school. I would be in fourth grade, and sixth grade, and eighth grade, and ninth grade. And it was quite an experience to, and in, interestingly, Pakistan has four provinces and there are four different languages that are spoken. Hmm. So, and there are different tribes that live in those provinces. So when you go to a different city, you end up in most likely in a different province. Hmm. It's a different language. People look different even. They have different appearances and uh, the North is different from the South and so on and so forth. And the language changes. So the customs, the practices, everything then is kind of different. So it was quite an experience. And I grew into, over the years, you know, in my uh, teenage years and so forth, I had friends in every part of the country. Mm. And these were not just friends, you know, that you went somewhere and you had a, and you got to know some of the people I studied with. And over the years, we kept in touch. So it was quite a, I think, quite a privilege to mm. make these, in that era when there was no Facebook and so on, to have this kind of connection where you could slip in and out of different quasi cultures or micro cultures in mm -hmm. the country. So yeah, it was a great experience. I think it opened my eyes and made me more welcoming and uh, more interested in other people and less scared of differences. Mm. I celebrated differences. Mm, for sure. It's great qualities. Was it unusual to go to, I guess, a Catholic school in Pakistan? Not at all. Uh, no? So, uh, this is amazing, right? The world as it would perceive that part of the world today. You, you can, oh, wow, how could it be? <laughs> it, was, it was just fine. And, um, you know, I still remember uh, these same cities, Quetta, where St. Francis Grammar School was, is now a hotbed of violence and so forth. But St. Francis Grammar School is still there. Father Josh, probably Father Joshua has probably died, but somebody else is there. <laughs> and uh, the, the, he was an Irishman. And, uh, and these were missionaries who had come in the, you know, 100 years ago, 60 years ago, 30 years ago, in, in, this, in search of their whatever missionary goals. And they were there, they opened schools, they were welcomed. These, these were the best schools of the country. And they're not one, they're dozens of such schools. Huh. Dozens of such schools. In the city of Karachi, St. Jude's, is, I never went to school, but I went to engineering university in Karachi. But I think St. Jude's is one I know, and there are quite a few others. Uh, St. Patrick's, famous St. Patrick's. Mm -hmm. The president, Musharraf, went to St. Patrick's. My own uncle, one of them, went to St. Patrick's, very prominent school in the city. So, so to answer your question, no, it wasn't unusual. And this was not just, these are schools, and they were girls' schools also. Mm. So oh. Jesus and Mary and, you know, those kinds. So they're all these schools, and it's still today. They are uh, St. Joseph's, where my mother went to school and my sister went to school, was one of the, still is one of the most sought after how to get your kid in kind of a school. That's super interesting. Wow. All that <laughs> moving around, I suppose, must have definitely made you quite a well-rounded youngster. But you did, you did mention Quetta a moment, a moment ago. And you, even back then, it was, you mentioned that it was kind of rough in certain, at certain times, certain, some sort of rough and tough people. And mm -hmm. I, I guess... You, at, at times when you look back on it, it was a, sometimes a tough time for you and you kind of felt a little bit belittled by some of these tough and rough people at times. So the way to, so I only have fond memories and uh, the way to look at it is that these are tribes. Mm. So certain provinces are a little more tribal than others. So these are tribal cultures. So if you go to a northern town, there are 
specific tribes of that area. And they've lived there for hundreds of years and they have their own customs. And of course, their children go to those schools. And these tribes are usually, uh, they're militant in nature. Mm. They, it's almost like this tribal whatever that uh, if you're not from the tribe, you're an outsider. I mean, think mm. about it, right? Whether it's Pakistan or India, there are hundreds of languages spoken there. Why is it that over time it hasn't changed? They haven't assimilated. And people have these differences. So in that sense, I felt that uh, I didn't belong to the tribe. So you always try to belong somewhere. And if you don't belong anywhere, then you stand out. And when you stand out, you sometimes feel the way perhaps I did. Uh, that everybody else has friends and I'm this, this new kid who's just arrived. Mm. In the school. So every time I had to start from scratch, uh, the whole process of getting to know other people and making friendships and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, at times it was tough in that sense, but it trains you for life, I suppose. And these kids of, like that were the, the children of these sort of tribal leaders. Did, did everyone kind of know who they were? Yes, yes. And there was this sort of tribal hierarchy also. Oh, this is from that tribe. And let's say there's a stronger tribe. There's a richer mm-hmm. tribe. Yeah. There is a political tribe. There is a militant tribe. So everyone had their own little uh, specializations, so to say. <laughs> and But they were all, um, I wouldn't say militant, but um, bordering on it. Mm. So you didn't mess with uh, one or the other. Yes. Because you don't fight with one person, you fight with the tribe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, it's quite interesting. Like I can, I can relate quite a bit to, to much more to the culture now. Like I think there's a real commonality between, uh, say, Africans, especially say South Africans, our tribal system, um, and you know that's between, you know that of India and Pakistan. Um, just uh, it's just interesting listening to the, to that part of it. I'm like, cool. Now I feel this this deeper connection, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but it's just a side note, but, um, as a youngster, you were also quite the reader and quite the cricketer too. So, you know, what sort of things were you reading and like, was cricket all consuming for you? So cricket, of course, uh, cricket is religion right over there. <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad it is. And, uh, books because of, the way we, as kids, uh, books were very important to my parents. So they would invest a lot in uh, buying books. And uh, since there were not enough, see, remember this is, uh, there are not like hundreds of bookshops and so forth and in English. So you would often buy books secondhand uh, because they would come in ships and they would be on a cart. Somebody would be going around in streets renting the books. You could rent a Reader's Digest. You could rent, and you could rent Shakespeare. You could rent all the classics because those were well known, and everybody knew that uh, you know you've got to read Tolstoy. You've got to read the great Russian whatever writers of that time, and you got to read uh, the Jane Austens and whatever you know. <laughs> And I was fascinated by the book that I found, I probably read a few times was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh I couldn't get over the fact that, you know, there was Captain Nemo who was my hero for a little while. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you've read it, but um, Jules Verne. And then my favorite of that time, uh, I, I want to go back and read it again, was Count of Monte Cristo. It is that perennial story of, you know, Edmund Dantes and the fact that he was wrongfully put in prison and lost his beloved Mercedes, which was the girl he was in love with and his, this guy, Albert. I mean, I'm reeling off this off 20, 30 years later in my life. I remember it so vividly. It impacted on you. <laughs> it impacted me because I thought I was, you know, you always want to cast yourself as some kind of complex hero. Yeah, and yeah. you're going to win in the end. And he does win in the end. <laughs> and, but there's a huge and a beautiful and a complex web and a yarn that you go through before you get there. So these are 
these are, I would say, I mean, I even read Les Miserables as a youngster and I thought Victor Hugo was the greatest thing and it kind of bothered me that they made a movie out of it. But how could you do that? <laughs> you have to read it. <laughs> yeah, don't ruin it. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I read a lot of books. I mean, not just a lot of books, lots and lots of books. That's great. And, and, your, and your sporting prowess and cricket, was that something that you were... Yes, in between I played cricket. So remember that temperatures, uh, now the world is hot everywhere, but in those days I thought it was only hot where I was. And uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, playing cricket in 110 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit um, was quite often. And I played, uh, I played a lot of cricket from since I was maybe 13, 14 years old. Well, one of my uncles, um, I have two uncles, both grew up in England. Uh, as did my mother when they were young. My my grandfather was a diplomat, so he was based out of London. And so my um, uncle used to play for Kent, I think. He's the one who has all these friends who are the South African cricket team. Uh -huh. And uh, so because he played with them in the English county scene. So he was a big inspiration because he was a cricketer. And then he's an ele electrical engineer too, but, you know, he played good cricket. So... I started playing cricket when I was maybe very young in the street and I was a fast bowler and I oh, could bat and um, and by the time I was maybe 17, 18, I was uh, playing decent cricket. I have bowled in the nets uh, to test cricketers and the you know, international teams would come and they'd bring the youngsters out. Nice. And, uh, you know, we had a chance to kind of say hello to them and... It's fantastic. I've, uh, I've met Kapil Dave. Uh, I've met Ian Botham. Nice. Uh, I even remember I met uh, Jeff Boycott. Um, I, I bowled in the net to some cricketers. And uh, of course, I saw the Pakistani cricketers. I remember once I played a match uh, where Javed Miyadad was playing. Mm. And he, I think he hit me for four sixes. <laughs> 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 oh, that's classic. I mean, these are the, I mean, I've met, uh, I've never, you know, Imran and people like that were way beyond. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I but, would do anything to go see Vivian Richards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, Kapil Dev, he's, he's an all time great, you know, for sure. So Kapil Dev was, uh, I consider him to be, you know, he was definitely these three great all rounders. The great three all, uh, four all rounders, Ian Botham, Richard Hadley, Kapil Dev, and Imran Khan. Mm. They played cricket at the same time. Mm. Wow. And uh, if you look at, um, I suppose it's kind of, we can talk about cricket, right? A little more because I have an important. <laughs> they, so there was this big debate that how do you tell? And in America, you know, every kind of statistic is used to analyze baseball players. And, you know, they mm. do it so well out here in the U.S. that you can rank people very well. In cricket, it's very hard. So if you take the four great all-rounders and you include Gary Sobers in it too. So Gary Sobers, Richard Hadley, Ian Botham, uh, Kapil Dev and Imran Khan. So the issue arises, who's the greatest? Yeah. And how do you decide? Now each one has, so they found a very, an Australian guy wrote a book on it and he did some research and he found a very simple statistic. You take if it's a great all-rounder, that means it's twice the cricketer than anybody else. You take the batting average and you subtract the bowling average from it. Huh. Huh. Okay. okay. The higher the difference, the greater the cricketer. Huh. So he bat his batting average has to be high and his bowling average has to be low. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Simple math. So now, if you take Gary Sobers, his batting average was 56 or 58. Don't ask me why I know these things. And... <laughs> And his bowling average is not a great bowler, but a bowler. He had a 32 bowling average, something like that. 32 runs per wicket. So the difference is 24, or something mm. like that. But he's not a great bowler, but he's a great batsman. Yeah. Turns out that uh, Kapil Dev, who's a great cricketer, his batting average and bowling average are roughly the same. Mm. He's a 28-29 bowling average and a 30-31 batting average. He's not a great batsman. He's a good bowler, but bowled in conditions where he gave more runs to get wickets. Right? In the yeah. Imran had a 38 or a 39 batting average and a 22-23 bowling average. That's Dale Stein-like. This is yeah. like Dale Stein. 
Yeah. I mean, this is the class, right? Dale Stein yeah. is a, he ta- in 40 balls, he'll take a wicket and his bowling average is 22. Yeah. <laughs> and Imran was at that level. Yeah. 22, 23. So this is, uh, I don't know what I was trying to answer, but to me, this was the, these are the cricketers of that time that, uh, and Imran, of course, has now become the prime minister. So he's yes. in a different league altogether. Is he now prime minister? That's crazy. Yeah, he's the prime minister of Pakistan. No ways. I didn't know he'd actually become it. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm always having been... Six months wow, that's, ago. That's Six incredible. Months. Yeah, he's, he's become the prime minister of the country. How do you how do you put that average into his greatest? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that I mean that guy of course confounds uh, logic. Uh, he was thirty nine when he won the World Cup in nineteen ninety two at Melbourne, and then he made a political party that Movement for Justice. And for the last since ninety four, he has been trying to do this, and in two thousand eighteen, he became the prime minister after losing three elections. So he, he's a, and then he's a big philanthropist. He's built cancer hospitals and universities, and so it gives me hope, right? It gives all of us hope that from within that, you know, what sometimes people would not be able to cast Pakistan as a place which is safe or whatever. But look at that. Yeah. There's a guy who's trying to fix the system. One would hope. Well, I mean, he's decidedly, definitely not a corrupt man. So. Yeah. So then let's see. Let's see what he does. I wish cool. him well. Great. You know what? Uh, there's some more parallels is what with Gareth was saying. You know, when when things people have a perception of a country like Pakistan, maybe like South Africa, and you have always got some sparks there that are are doing amazing things. When when the when things are really tough, you know. And, uh, yeah. We just, I mean, South Africa has uh, such an amazing, what an amazing canvas is South Africa. And, uh, endless beauty. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thanks. So so talking about Pakistan, um the the perception as you mentioned is a little bit different maybe to to people in the west of of what Pakistan is like, but but when you when you were younger, there were a lot of tourists and and hiking and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I remember I remember in the you know in the trains the people would go and you'd see these guys, uh, girls, men, women, they came there for the best weed. And uh, for you know the the pot or marijuana or hashish, and mm-hmm. they'd be I, I've seen people just roaming around the streets, the kind of quasi hippies or leftovers of the hippie era. And I'm talking uh, late 70s, even even in the 80s, you could see that. And um, now uh, it's changed a lot, but. Uh, it's, there was no violence. There was no issue. It was the most hospitable place in the whole world. Went there, and people came. Tourist tourism was there, and um, exciting things happened. So, so maybe you can tell us because I was reading in uh, the sort of excerpt of the book that you uh, gave us to read. You you spoke a bit about the changes that happened. You know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about those changes. Um, you know, they're quite radical. Yeah, and you know they can be summarized uh, to a very particular event when uh, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan um, in late seventies, and I, I was young, too young to actually remember that, but uh, that had happened, and it was seventy eight or something like that, and uh, Iran had uh, the, the Khomeini revolution in I think seventy nine. And the Iranian government, uh, the Shah of Iran had toppled. So that, if you think about it, Pakistan on one side has Iran, and uh, another side it has um, Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Then it has a bit of uh, China, mm-hmm. and then it has India, and uh, Uzbekistan and those Tajikistan, the Russian republics uh, the, at that time, the Soviet Empire. That they are also right there. So it's wow. strategically, it's it's surrounded by these. Um, country. So when the Russians invaded, there was this big, the first war, the first uh, Afghan war was fought. And the Americans were trying to push back the communists from uh, that time, from Afghanistan. And that's when the Mujahideen and all those people were fighting. And um, I remember that until that time, we didn't see any violence. But then suddenly when the huge refugee influx happened into Pakistan, perhaps one of the world's largest refugee. People left Afghanistan and came into Pakistan and they were kept in 
tens, millions of people came. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. was involved in, in Rambo 2 is a movie that actually kind of is set in that time. Rambo 3, I think, where he goes to, the, to save somebody, some soldier or whatever. So this is that era when the, so uh, that was a big change. And it was, a, it, it almost seems that those events happened completely randomly. That Russia invades Afghanistan, um, people get pushed out. America decides that we need to push Russia back and we need to arm the Afghans to fight against the Russians. Mm. And uh, Mujahideens come t- together. The Mujahideens end up, their children are born in Pakistan and those children are called the Taliban. Mm-hmm. So who, who wow. could have crafted this story? No Jeez. way. Uh, this the Talib means student. And mm-hmm. uh, so they lived in tents and camps provided by foreign aid. And uh, because there was nowhere to go and these amazing cricketers that you see from Afghanistan, if you go back to there, they literally learned cricket on the streets of Pakistan. Goodness. So if wow. you look at the Afghan team, it's an amazing cricket team. And um, these are all natural, unorthodox cricketers. You can spin mm-hmm. the ball differently. And so anyway, going back to this whole, uh, so that is, the inflection point and I saw the influx of guns and violence and all that started then because the country had suddenly received millions of people and there was this foreign aid coming in. There was something called Afghan transit trade. At some point I should write all this. There's something called the Afghan transit trade. So in Pakistan, you could buy foreign cheese uh, because it would come without any taxes from all over the world, because remember, Afghanistan is landlocked. There is no sea or ocean. So anything that has to go in, Iran had closed its border to America. Khomeini had come into power. The Russian side was, of course, not going to be. So Pakistan was the entry point. Mm -hmm. All the ships would come and they would take this food and guns and everything through Pakistan. Mm -hmm. The military movement, everything happened through Pakistan. Pakistan was literally the base to fight this war. We could buy, the, I remember that era because you could buy American products like cheese and biscuits and cookies and cigarettes for almost pittance because they would just come in huge quantities and then they would be bootlegged kind of by the people who, instead of going to Afghanistan, they'd be sold in Pakistan for a higher price. Wow. There's a whole industry. So that was the era. And, um, and, you know, in Karachi, there used to be a friendship house, which would be KGB, and there would be a, a American, American cultural center, which would be the sort of the counter of the KGB. Yeah, it was, I think this was an amazing era where wow. this was just happening, and I'm growing up and watching this, and um, the country changes. It's almost like, you know, like you put something in the microwave and you want it and you know, wait, you put it at four minutes and now it's down three, two, one, zero. So there was a wow. countdown happening, but it was happening over two decades. Wow. But you could predict that this is not going to end well. You are arming people who are refugees and you are uh, you know, providing them very hard conditions to live in. They'll, they'll fight back, they'll, they'll fight. And we saw that happen, right? All this anger and angst and everything. Till today, we are seeing it. It's an endless war. Yeah. Fascinating. It's just incredible always because you always think things are kind of stable wherever you are in the world, but, but, but they're not, you know, like, and, you, and when people have lived through something like that, you, you, you just realize how in flux and how fragile things are actually. And Craig, you don't notice it when it's happening. It's like, you know, the frog in that water where you increase the temperature one degree each time. It doesn't know that something bad is about to happen. At one point, the water will get very hot and I'll just get boiled. And when you live through it, so when I was growing up, and and I can only, I had no, I mean, I had a fantastic, um, you you know, childhood and teen years and college and university. When I was growing up, I didn't really know what was happening. Uh, And, you know, I must admit, I was an optimist then, and I'm an optimist today, with 
the great belief that these are 20, 30 year spans. I mean, uh, we can see countries change within a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, things can just change, right? The Berlin Wall just went down. There is no East or West. Germany. We can do I mean, apartheid in South Africa. It's mm. gone, done, over. And it seemed, oh God, it will never end. It ended. Generations have come after that. It can only get better. And, you know, I feel we just saw, a, so I've witnessed a certain era, and I think that um, we are beyond it now. It's yeah. maybe other problems will come, but this one's gone. I yeah. think it's a good time now. Wow, it's so interesting. Seriously, history is so important to to understand, and um, I would definitely love for you to to write more about that. I think you know the more people that that can understand what went on and stuff is is really really important, and and you tell it so well. Um, but just actually moving on a little bit, uh, you went to the U.S. Uh, after school, but then you briefly returned back uh, to Pakistan. Um, yeah, so I did my engineering, my electrical engineering from a university in Karachi. So after all these 10 to 12 different schools, my father moved. I was born in Karachi and then lived in every other city. And then we finally moved back to Karachi. And my father moved back and we had a house there. And I went to a, a university called NED University. And uh, it's made by... Uh, somebody called Nadir Shaw, Evil G, didn't show that by any D. And um, uh, I studied electrical engineering. And um, uh, and I kind of felt that an undergrad or a bachelor's is not sufficient. And I didn't feel that, but my parents and my various... <laughs> <laughs> the pressure was on. <laughs> yeah, and my, my elder sister the doctor, my younger sister was very brilliant in doing whatever she did. And so I had to go on. So in, as it turned out that I went to America and I went there to study semiconductors and uh, get a master's. And I ended up in um, University of Colorado at Boulder for a very strange reason. I wanted to go to Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley but they didn't give me a scholarship and it was anathema to study without getting a scholarship. So wherever I went, I had to get a scholarship. You see. So it wasn't that I just go and pay a tuition. You have to be good enough to get a scholarship. So anyway, so Berkeley did not give me a scholarship. And if you see that one day I taught at Berkeley, so that was, there was you know, divine vengeance there. So, <laughs> So I um, came to Colorado for a very strange reason. Uh, early on, when I was a teenager, I discovered a Western novelist called Louis L'Amour. And um, he used to write about all these cowboys and all that in the wild, wild west. And I used to read his novels with great interest. You know, it's, it's like change of taste after a classic. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, after William Makepeace Thackeray, a Louis L'Amour Western is a very good <laughs> for a palate cleanser. So, uh, so I uh, ended up in Colorado because he used to write about Colorado. And uh, also UCB or University of Colorado and Boulder kind of had the same three alphabets as University of California and Berkeley. So that's how I ended up. <laughs> Literally, that's how I ended up there. <laughs> no, it was, it was, there was no, you know, I just wanted to. Anyway, so, so I came here for you know, masters and possibly a PhD in semiconductors or it's called semi chips and all that, and um, lost interest in it very quickly. I thought that that was not fun because there was a class going on which had this nice sign which said brains, minds, and computers. This is far more fun. <laughs> and, uh, I just kind of did what I liked while I was doing my master's and uh, finished my master's in about 15 months and went back thinking, yeah, that is how it started. And, and there was uh, some interaction with uh, Tom Hanks, wasn't there, at uh, UC Boulder, so which is quite a funny story. So I never met him, and this is a this is a myth or reality. I've never been able to <laughs> ascertain. Um, 
I was, um, so when I came back, uh, so I came back to Pakistan after my master's and then I decided that um, I want to pursue a PhD and luckily I got a scholarship to do that. And so I came back, I became a research assistant and all that. And while I was working, um, during that time, I was also working um, to make money and to, it was a good opportunity for me to work and study. And I was working at a NASA center called BioServe Space Technology. So NASA had six or seven centers across the US inside universities where they would give money to do groundbreaking research towards various areas of space. And um, I, being, being an electrical engineer by training, I could design things. I can actually fix TVs. So <laughs> it was a, a good skill to have. And um, so I went from electrical engineering to aerospace engineering for a basic reason. I was following the money. Whoever could pay me, I was <laughs> ready to go there. <laughs> So most of the things I've done in life have been have followed my heart. So that's why I always say I'm very similar to Pocahontas. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah. She followed, she followed her heart. <laughs> or she was at least advised to follow her heart. So I followed. <laughs> so, so I went there and uh, you know, met some great, great professors and great colleagues of mine. And I started designing these experiments. And one of the, so the space is really the easiest way to define it is there is no gravity pulling you kind of float around in space and it's zero g nothing pulling you down so uh, whatever do you design experiments for space so forth it means you want to understand how humanity could survive in such conditions that means whatever is related to humanity so the group i worked with was called controlled ecological life support systems <laughs> And I designed experiments. So how do you test an experiment? You know, you, nobody's going to send your experiment to space to have microgravity. <laughs> All you can do is either have a drop tower, a high, you know, thousand foot drop tower. It might give you five, six seconds of microgravity as you're coming down very fast. Or you go into these experimental aircrafts that the US, the NASA has, they call their retrofitted Boeings. And they'll go up and down like this and create this parabola and when they go up and then come down there is microgravity for 26 seconds hmm. 26 seconds is a gold mine wow. amount, wow. amount of time to do to test something out yeah. uh, so in that when in those 20 seconds whoever is inside the plane is floating nauseous <laughs> and vomiting <laughs> in most cases and you know usually they are not all trained uh, but astronauts are yeah. both types they're the well-trained uh, astronauts, and then there's those scientists who are healthy, but they're not physically the, at the caliber of an astronaut who could be a, yeah. a very super fit creature. <laughs> so my experiment was in one of these crafts, and uh, I couldn't go there because I was a foreign national, but my experiment was there. So one of some of my colleagues who were in the fl flight, when it came back, the experiment it turned out that it had a smell. and somebody had thrown up on it and it turns out in the same flight there was Tom Hanks and he was uh, doing, doing his you know he's a great actor so he tries practices and he was trying to experience all those things that he was going to play the character for so that's yeah cool. that's, a, that, that's a great story I mean he won two Oscars so after wow. I, I awesome. think I'm kind of responsible and which movie was that that he was Apollo 13? Apollo 13, yeah. yeah. yeah I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty, that's a pretty yeah. cool story that, that you had some interaction in a, in a sort of a peripheral way with him. But it sounds yeah. fascinating, the kind of work you were doing as well. But what you were mentioning that, um, you know, the, the experiments involved sort of hydroponics and how water affects seeds and plants in space. Yeah, so, and, and you, so you was, sort of yeah. it was early a, days of something there. I think so. I mean, it's, it's obviously a very important question that uh, mankind asks at times that what if we had to go and live in space? And I don't know if you follow sci-fi, but those listeners who actually follow science fiction, like Battlestar Galactica and places, you know, there is this whole concept that there'll be these huge ships and there'll be people living in them and Earth would be waiting for Earth to get more, say, hospitable or habitable. And... Um, if you think of it that way of a space station and all that, how will you, how will humanity survive? They'll need food. They'll need basic social system. They'll need some law and order and you know, governance, et cetera. So these are the kind of things you think about. One of the things that we was thinking about, how do you grow food in space? 
you can't take soil there. Soil is very heavy. So you've got to find ways to grow plants in something. And in that case, there's this insulation material which goes into these uh, walls, which mm -hmm. kind of insulates it. And it's a fire retardant because you don't want houses to burn down. So that yeah. fire retardant is very light and it's inert in the sense that there's no electrical connectivity. You can't conduct um, electricity through it. And, uh, and you can grow plants in it. So that's what we discovered. Some people say that you can take wire mesh, very thin wire and grow plants in it because you need a substrate to hold the roots and mm -hmm. things like that. So that's the hydroponics in some ways. And then how do you irrigate the plant, give it the nutrients, which is really sodium, potassium, or what we call water or water the plant. You're really supplying <laughs> nutrients to it. So that's what I, uh, so my challenge was that how do you grow a plant in space and make sure that the water goes to the root? Hmm. Then there is no gravity and you don't know if the root is going, down. there's no way for the root to know that it's got to go down. There's nothing huh. pulling it down. Wow. And the shoot doesn't, there is no gravity, right? You are now in, so the root would <laughs> grow upwards. Yeah. But the root always follows where the water is. Mm. But if you have a black box, if I give you a black box, like in this water thing, where is, um, and I, how do I tell where the root is? It's impossible, right? It's, mm. I don't know where it, it, there's a plant growing in it. So my experiments were to find where the water is. Mm. So there's a lot of math and simulation. But these are the kind of, fun stuff that I've done. Yeah. Wow. It's fascinating. fascinating. Seriously. When you said that now, like the roots growing sort of upside down, it made me think like, you know, there's, they talk about like there's the upside down world and stuff like that. And uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's one of those other sort of layers. And I mean, we take it for granted, right? We take gravity for granted. What if mm. there was no gravity? We would be perpetually making an effort to, you know, stay aligned and do something yeah yeah for sure so you know talking about sci-fi and and space and these sort of things what are your thoughts on the prospects of getting to mars we actually had a lady on our podcast a while back over a year ago now diane mcgraw who is uh, like i think she's been she's part of the, the last 100 people um on the project Mars program, which uh, I don't know if it's still going or not. There was some news recently that it had stopped, but anyway, what are your thoughts of going to Mars as humans? So, you know, we can, that's, that's something we can debate for, you know, that is, is Mars going to be the place or is there some other place that we need to go to or plan to go to? Is it going to be the most the way I look at it is that we have to have a crazy aspiration and we have to make this statement that we can go there and then start. You only look for things mm. that you're, you only find things that you're looking for. So look for something amazing because then you'll find something amazing. So this to say that there will be life on Mars to me is an aspirational statement, which makes human beings so amazing mm. that he will do this. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever you find in that journey may really end up taking you there, or it may not. But having that goal is what I think. So if somebody says we're going to find life on Mars and there are 100 people that are working on it, I think more power to you. Mm -hmm. You will get there. Keep looking. You know, we can be cynical, but having those aspirations is very important. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. And, and I think what you said, it's it's not necessarily getting there. It's like, what are the offshoots of trying yeah. to get there? So like, you know, the stuff that she was working on was we, we can't have pollution in Mars. Okay, cool. So now we've got to test this on planet earth. So it's going to help us in some way on earth. And, and maybe that's yeah. all it ends up being, which is amazing. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'll give you another example, which uh, I find, you know, today, you and I are talking to each other on a computer over the internet using a video conferencing system. It exists today because of something called the internet. And the mm. internet exists today because there was some government agency we got, which got the money to try crazy things. Mm. DARPA, the, that was the inventor of the, so big, of the internet, or they were the ones who funded all this. 
if that government money had not been given to some crazy guys in some place, they wouldn't have found this. They wouldn't have done this. Businesses sometimes don't do things without a well-defined return on investment. Mm. So the fact that somebody was allowed to do it, to your point, it created an offshoot today, mm. which has changed the world. Mm. The internet exists because of that. Uh, Steve Jobs goes to a place and he finds something which is eventually becomes a mouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but it's sitting there in that place for many years, nobody found it, but somebody had the you know, vision or the initiative to do something. Somebody gave money to some research lab, which did something to me, the, it is very important to see this, to have this aspiration this sort mm. of curiosity, this dreamlike attitude, which uh, to many ways, that is what America was so great. It was so great about uh, so many things that have happened here. They yeah. did it. Mm. Yeah. We, we often, we often sort of speak about that and, and as well, and on a, on a sort of a small scale, like just with us, we, we think about, you know, let's start a podcast and, and it's a aspirational goal and, and so much stuff comes. So, so even, on you talking about these grand scales, but it's also a good idea to maybe look at giving yourself these kind of aspirational goals just on an individual level, because something will come out of it from doing little projects in your life. You know, I mean, I never thought I'd go on a podcast and uh, <laughs> you probably didn't think that you'd be running a podcast uh, show uh, yeah. while doing other things, but you are doing it because there is something you're looking for. And in this process, who knows but which person you talk to and you'll create some uh, stream of sentences or something profound will happen, which some guy will or girl will listen to. Mm -hmm. you, randomly, it can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the beauty of it all. But by not doing it, by doing it, we are doing something useful, creating something. Yeah. So to your point, Gareth, it's... Um, aspirations and crazy ass big aspirations are a beautiful thing preserve <laughs> them enjoy them give them to others yeah i like how you put that it's really cool <laughs> <laughs> and um but just moving on in your story there so you so you you know doing a lot of interesting things um with with revolving around nasa and you'd, you'd move countries all this stuff's going on but it was also a bit of a tough time for you and and unfortunately things worked out the way they did and, and you sort of ended up um, going separate ways from your, your wife at the time, but it actually left you in a, in a sort of a really tough financial situation. So, yeah. Um, so that is, um, as I, so when I started the, and I will get to it when I, the current company that I'm, my current company, my current love of life, um, <laughs> I tried to understand why did I end up here? Like, why did I choose to do what I'm doing? Why did I become the way I became? You know, in retrospect, you sometimes try to backtrack and say, what happened? Uh, and I can trace it to certain experiences, of course, growing up in a society which had inequality in it. Uh, opens your eyes and if you notice that some people are poor some are not even even able to read or write so you see that in some people they can go into perfect denial it didn't happen i didn't care don't. some people feel a little more sensitive about it so for me as i look back that was a big inflection point in my life this this experience of being saddled with a debt which I believed I not only was accountable for it, but I was responsible for it. Not that I had to be, but I felt that I was. Because eventually my, the fact that I finished my, when I finished my PhD and I stayed in America, I stayed in America to pay off a debt. The fact that I ended up staying in America for 30 years now is, not was not the plan i and i just wanted to pay my debt and get do something else in life but there's no no bad thing there's nothing bad it's all events so this experience and in retrospect it feels that way at that moment to be saddled with you know a reasonable size debt for somebody who's making 11 1200 dollars a month and uh, 
to discover that you have to make a payment of I think 750 a month to service a debt, which uh, you, I could say I wasn't totally responsible for. Of course, I was responsible for it. Is how I, you know, it's my life. So whatever is connected to it is that way. That taught me a lot. Uh, and I went into denial. I forgot about it. I didn't want to think about it. It's only now that I can talk about it. Because it's yeah. a very hard thing, you know, when you go and get a car. And I remember when I moved to Silicon Valley and it was, I was working and I went to get a car. And the guy said that we have to pull your credit report. Now, I had a credit report, but it was what is called, it was suppressed because I had no credit cards. Mm -hmm. I lived on cash. Mm -hmm. And here I am, a person making lots of money, extremely educated. People would talk to me and think that I walked on water. But I was scared shitless about even talking to somebody if they asked me for my credit. I was not supposed to have a credit card for two years as I had finished the payment and I'd gone through a whole process. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, that is... And I was, it was okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But uh, if I go and somebody pulls, says, you know, you make a lot of money, let me pull your credit report. And why don't you buy this Mercedes? And I, mm. well, I can't. If I go to a restaurant, uh, uh, I can't take a credit card out and pay the bill. If mm. it's a $200 bill, I have to give my uh, money in cash. And everybody would look at me and say, why do you always have cash? <laughs> what are you doing? What business are you in? And I'd say, well, guys, I always keep $500. And uh, till today, I have $500 in my, <laughs> always. <laughs> because you're, you know, you think about it, you know, things change in your head and in your, the way you live. So that was a pretty uh, tough time. And um, when I was in my PhD and I was finishing it and, this discovery and um, to live in, and you know, people live with a lot less and all that, but it does shape you. And mm. I knew one thing through all that. Um, I felt that it wasn't my fault, but it was my responsibility. There's a subtle nuance here. It's, mm -hmm. I didn't, it's not my fault, but it's my responsibility and I'm accountable for it. And I then said that there must be thousands and millions of people like me in this world. Mm. I didn't say it then, but today I say it with veracity. Mm. And who's helping them? I got helped. So mm. in some ways, that's the, you know, that kind of the full circle came to now and I can justify, rationalize. Mm. It. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting that there's a, there was a few things there. It's interesting how like the, the ego can get in our way to, to sort of admit things um, when, you know, it's kind of shameful. Um, but also uh, it's interesting that you just said fault and responsibility because Will Smith literally posted a video about it this week on Facebook and it was absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure it was Whereas responsibility was definitely the one thing and I think fault was the other as well. And he was explaining the difference between the two. Um, so, so anyway, just, just a couple of things there. It's interesting that you said that. But what did you actually do at the time to start improving your financial situation and get out of debt? So it, it, the debt, so usually debt, uh, you know, you, the, the famous thing is that you don't get into debt overnight. You know, sometimes you do something dramatic happens, but usually it's practices or habits that you have. And over time, you kind of charge your, build the balance on your credit cards and so forth. In my case, I had zero debt on day one. On day two, I had a $30,000 debt mm. overnight. Something I didn't know even existed. And so to pay that back, I had to put a lot of uh, discipline. So I didn't know what to do. Um, I got some help. Uh, my my professor at that time eventually found out, and um, there were calls coming to the lab that you know where is he? Any other collection calls and all that. So then I went to a counseling consumer credit counseling service, and they had a simple worksheet, and they said this is what you owe, and this is what you have to pay, and we can make this payment a lump sum payment, so you don't have to every month you pay this amount 
and uh, they, they said that you should it should be about 40 percent of you what you make maximum i said i want to do more because i want to get out of this faster they said well the the most we can do is close to 70 percent or something mm. and would you take it and this is usually designed because you have to have another family member that can support you or that kind of a thing I kind of quasi lied to them or just pretended, yeah, there's someone else and I can I don't have to pay rent and things like that. So they said, okay, you're gonna pay seven fifty, that's good. Wow. And so I have four hundred dollars a month and I have to pay my rent and I have to do all kinds of things and also look cool. Goodness. So so I look cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to have the occasional sushi. So um, <laughs> and it was it was uh, it was it was an interesting period. I graduated and then uh, I came to Silicon Valley. Part of the reason I came to Silicon Valley because I could pay off my debt. Ah. So. Well done. It's that, it's, I think it's, as you mentioned, lots of people are in that situation. And uh, it's a really scary thing how things can rack up uh, really quickly and uh, people really find themselves in trouble. So but thanks for sharing that because I think it is a thing where people often don't want to sort of discuss or, or talk about openly because it's, it's sort of a shameful feeling, you know? Um, but it's also, if you don't know how, how it works to get to that point, it's not your, necessarily your fault as you were mentioning to, on some level, you know? So it's, it's good that you, we educate and then talk about that stuff. So later on, just moving forward a little bit, you, you actually in Silicon Valley, as you mentioned, and uh, your, you actually, uh, your company in Infinox was acquired uh, later down the track and you ended up um, sort of getting into retirement and uh, playing lots of golf and life was good, but you actually sort of felt that there was something missing and some meaning was missing in your life and you wanted to actually solve a specific problem that you'd identified in that time or over the years, uh, which was that $160 billion was being charged as fees to people living paycheck to paycheck. So this kind of led to you founding Pay Active. So how did you come to this idea? So this, uh, uh, so when I sold, um, uh, when I exited uh, Infinox, it was acquired and I exited. I did not have a plan in life beyond. So here's what we plan. Okay, you need to get educated. So I had the highest degree that was possible. The other plan is that you need to have you know, financial independence, which I had achieved. And I really needed to, I didn't need to work another day of my life. And uh, I was done. So what was the plan after that? I mean, uh, I could pick up the phone and say to my parents that, did you guys, guys raise me with some plans that I had to do, that you have to study, you have to be, I've achieved all those. What am I supposed to do now? I don't like, I don't particularly care for traveling. I don't like expensive cars. Uh, I have no habits which require me to, you know, I don't party and, you know, I have no such uh, desires. Uh, I just read books and uh, watch movies or things like that. So it was a very interesting point in my life. And um, so much so that uh, I had to find it. And then people would come and say to me that, you know, become an advisor to my company or invest in my company. Or, this is Silicon Valley, right? It's, a, it's hubris and genius all combined together and materialism and spiritualism, everything kind of, it's a big <laughs> messed up Rubik's cube. So, and uh, so I, uh, and by the way, I'm exactly one and a half miles from Apple headquarters. This is where I'm sitting. So um, maybe two miles. <laughs> so um, I didn't uh, know what to do. So I knew one thing. I wanted to teach. Another thing uh, that I wanted to read, and I had great interest in Greek history, so I wanted to read that. So I needed, there were a few things I did. So all I did was I got up in the morning, and I didn't have to take a shower, and I just all day long, I'd do that. And then one fine morning, I uh, got advised by people who care for me and around me that, you know, <laughs> you might need to get a life. <laughs> and, um, so I uh, actually, luckily, a friend of mine called me and said, do you want to help? I'm teaching at Berkeley. And do you want to help me? And that was inspiration enough. 
So I started mentoring a class in Berkeley. So this was a business school class. So this was a teacher and he needed some couple of people to help him. It was a big senior level class, uh, MBA class. And I enjoyed it so much and I had an interest to teach. So I became uh, whatever industry level faculty or adjunct or something like that. So that was something that had started, which was great. And I had this itch in me that one day I want to enter University of California at Berkeley and, uh, you know, get over the rejection I felt of many years ago. <laughs> I wanted to apply. <laughs> so that, was, that was a cool feeling, but I still didn't, I couldn't fill the 10, 8, 10 hours of the day. Luckily, a friend called me and said that uh, we know that you played cricket and you occasionally play golf, but do you want to play golf? And suddenly I discovered something that could keep me occupied for five, six hours every day. <laughs> and if you drive 50 miles, that's an hour to drive. Then, you know, after the 18th hole, you sit around, have some drinks and things like that. So this was perfect. I had an eight hour day. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have to meet people. I, you know, pitching ideas or whatever. And you make great friends. And on golf courses, you meet either very rich people or very old people. And, uh, <laughs> So they often ask you questions that what do you do or things like that. And honestly, that's how it happened. I met all these wonderful people on the golf course who were either investment bankers or venture capitalists. And they'd kind of say, you see, and if, if you've done it before, you know, you, you're certainly very, as you know, if you've, if you've built a company and all that in Silicon Valley, that's kind of considered that you've arrived. So people would always say, why wouldn't you do another one? I said, why would I do another one? <laughs> Why would I do that? And then I started thinking about it. And that is why my whole life became a movie for me that I had, whether these, you know, you remember selectively. And I, and I wanted, and you know, and at that time, I, of course, read, um, again, I read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. And that book always, you know, after, after every five years, you should read it mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it puts you back on the, and I, and I was reading it and I was thinking that I, I need to find a purpose. And I, I really despise this word passion, this word passion now, because I think passion is something you have for, you know, let's say football or cricket. You can't do it for 24 hours, mm. but purpose is something that persists. It's 24 hours with you. You sleep mm. with it, you eat with it, it, you live with it. That's your purpose. Between that journey of uh, purpose, you can have passion and things like that. So anyway, I went ahead and, um, uh, kept thinking that what would it be that uh, what would completely inspire me and make me leap out of bed in, in the morning and completely devote myself. That's why I say you, you have to fall in love with your business. It is, you know, I, I don't know if entrepreneurship uh, was something that you must have talked to people. For me, the definition of it is you're in love with it. Mm -hmm. you, you are it. It is you. You are it. And this idea there was no idea. It was a purpose. Can I do something for the lower income people of America? I didn't set out to build a technology or have an idea or whatever. I wanted to solve a problem. That's just in a little while ago, I said about this thing about Mars or whatever. You set your mind to do something and only when you're looking for something, you find it. If you're not looking for something, only Madame Curie could find something. <laughs> you hear these stories and Newton finds you know, a ray of light comes into his window and suddenly he discovers a prism. Those things don't happen with lesser mortals like me. So <laughs> I had to actively think of something. And that something was this data in America that two thirds of the country was paying this exorbitant amount of money. And I'm thinking, now how is it that the richest country in the world has this third world in its belly? what went wrong. And there is compelling data. We don't need to go into it. Everybody now talks about it. People are living, you know, they don't have any savings. A hundred million people don't have $400 in an emergency. And this is a very different system, right? There is no universal health care and things like that. It's... So I uh, wanted to do something about it. And I said, what will I do? And then I stumbled upon this, this epiphany because there's this debate that people have to be paid a certain level, the level of salary. Then there's this debate that people should be taxed less or more, the structure of salary. What the world had ignored was the timing when you are paid. We talk about level of salary, structure of salary, 
but the timing or when you're paid is somehow considered gospel. Why? Who decided a monthly salary as the cadence or two week, bi-weekly? Who decided that? And I have asked people, and they look at me, economists, academics, and I said, who decided it? Oh, this is how the taxes are. But it has always been like that. But why? Netflix does not say that you have to watch the program. And news is not like that anymore. No business is like that anymore. Mm-hmm. Everything's on demand real time. But uh, the example that I always give is, uh, both of you perhaps, I don't know if you rent or you... Um, own your homes, but if you rented a place, you would pay in advance. The rent would be paid in advance, right? Mm. You pay for the, and if you were a business, you would pay your vendors upon delivery or you'll have terms that I'll pay you 30 months, 30 days later. So it will be 1% more because you supplied me the goods and material and I'll pay you in 30 days. And if you were, let's say a coffee shop, your customers would pay you immediately after you gave them the coffee or the juice or whatever you're selling, they'll Mm -hmm. pay you immediately. So your landlord gets money in advance. Your vendors get it upon delivery. Your customers pay you immediately. But the guy who works behind the counter has to wait two weeks or a month. Mm -hmm. I mean, what logic is that? Mm -hmm. And if that person is really poor, for that person to tell you that I'm in a financial bind, he or she has to be embarrassed by it. Why? Mm -hmm. That person is an hourly worker. He's embarrassed to tell you that he doesn't have $10 and he'll leave work and actually borrow it from a loan shark. Mm-hmm. So these are the kind of things I said, why is the system like that? And that was the birth of uh, this company, PayActive. And that was the reason for leaping out of bed every morning and having a smile on your face. Wow. What a purpose. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, uh, it's so interesting what you say. Like everything is made up, isn't it? When you, when you think about it. And yeah. I mean, it is, it is. And you know, the, the, this whole journey allowed me to, I studied it because I couldn't believe the world had missed this one thing called the timing of pay. It, it is so simple <laughs> that if you are paid less, if you are paid less, you have to be paid more frequently. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. If I tell you that you can at most have 630 calories in the day, which is half of even very low diet, how would you have them once in the 24 hours or you will spread them over 24 hours? Spread them out. Probably spread them out. Exactly. If you had 3000 calories, would you have them once in the night? Or you'll spread them out. You'll spread them out. You should, first of all, you shouldn't have 3,000 calories. <laughs> <laughs> this is America this is like, we're talking about as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's 4,000. 4, <laughs> so, uh, so exactly. So if you have to work out, should you run a marathon every weekend or you should do a little bit of it every day? Of course, every day. So when it comes to eating, grazing versus binging is better. When it comes to workout, steady every day, the less you have, the more you, you know, the famous stubby pencil experiment. Kids were given a pencil which was very tiny and a full pencil. The tiny pencil people, kids, used it more f- carefully and it lasted mm. longer than the kids who mm. kept sharpening the pencil. Mm. <laughs> so the, all these experiments and data is there. So we know that ma- mathematically and scientifically and behaviorally, less you are paid, more frequently you should be paid. And, you know, you, you're from South Africa. It's a huge, payday loans is a huge problem in South Africa. Yeah, massive. Yeah. And, you know, Wanda I actually worked for a loan shark for a while in South Africa when I was a student job. Yeah. And I saw how damaging it is for, um, it changed my view on these things as well. And I, I'd never thought of it like that, though. And it, it just makes so much sense. It messes up lives because what happens is yeah. you can never get out of debt. And every month you pay something to push it by another month the rollovers happen. Yeah. So this led me to, so what I am doing is this idea or this particular idea of timing of pay is one component of it. That's always, you have to have something unique, right? If you take any business, you'll see that their primary business is something that like Google searches you, their primary focus or some other company. There's some unique thing that they do. In our company, we have this uh, ability to invent money, so to say. 
by changing the timing of pay. Mm -hmm. I, like you have, if you use your calendar very well, you'll have more hours in the day, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and those guys who don't use their calendar well have less hours in the day, but it's the same yeah. 24 hours. The guy who uses his money wisely and doesn't pay all these little penalties, fees, and all that late fees, overdrafts, will have more money at the end of the day. So we've built a financial wellness business around this. That's to me, was a great... Um, the problem we have solved, we want to be the American Express for the poor. That's what I'm doing. That's really, really awesome. It's so interesting, like the, the timing of this conversation, because I was playing around on some Facebook groups yesterday and people were, the, the, one of the questions people were asking for was like, like asking, what is the one thing that they want in their life? And almost everyone was saying like financial freedom. And I'm not, mm. you know, like it was really interesting. But like, wh why do you think um, so many people live from paycheck, paycheck to paycheck and also really struggle with financial planning? Because mentally, we are we're wired in such a way uh, that uh, we are wired in such a way that we have great hope. Like if you and let's say, and let me do something morbid here. We both of us know that we can't live forever. Mm -hmm. That's the polite way of me saying that we know we are going to die. Mm -hmm. How much do we think about it every day? Zero times. Mm. Absolutely, we don't think about it for weeks, months, years, and you know, we don't. Even if somebody, we watch somebody dying, we don't think about our mortality. Mm. This is the most amazing human capacity that we think that tomorrow will be better than today. And people say that America, in America, this belief is the strongest. I think that tomorrow will be better than today. That is what makes America this place where. You don't have to plan. It's a country of second chances. Tomorrow will be better than today. Do whatever you need to do today. Tomorrow will be better than today. I think part of it is that. Part of it is that a huge swath of people is just not paid enough. Part of it is that, I don't know if you know that, that over $1 trillion are spent every year in aggressive marketing. And mm. people are manipulated. I would use the word manipulated cautiously, but I think fairly, to buy things that they don't need. And the marketing has become extremely potent with the consensus of star, uh, Facebook likes and the bragging that we do of our spending that I bought this or this vacation I went to or I got these new sneakers and I bought, I'm wearing this special cap hat whatever camera there's a lot of bragging right to spending which has been accelerated with social media and picture sharing and instagram people are spending more we are also uh, we are also attributing we are also using products to define ourselves what we wear what phone we carry etc cetera, etc cetera. we are spending more and we are also becoming more and more, uh, I would say, the right, I don't know the right word, but it's almost like we have more hope than before that some, something's going to bail us out. Mm -hmm. Or, and with the, with the increase in, you know, in the US at least with the opioid crisis and all that, mm -hmm. it almost seems that we can also um, go and feel good about it too. We can get high also. <laughs> so, so I, I think combination of marketing, combination of this amazing hope that we have to tomorrow is better than today and uh, uh, being um, not, not just not earning enough and a mm. um, lot of automation, a lot of jobs have gone away. A uh, lot of people have been left in this state where they just don't have, they just live this paycheck to paycheck life and they think it's okay. Yeah. And, and Safwan, I just wanted to sort of maybe be a little bit of devil's advocate here. So I, I don't know how much responsibility corporations have for the spending habits of their staff, for example, but doesn't holding back salaries somehow force savings 
or help people to not, you know what I mean? Like, it, sure, like you said with sure. a pencil, maybe, maybe if they have a little bit less in the bank that they'll, they'll slow down the spending or something to that effect. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, if you, if you had uh, more in your pocket and more frequently in your pocket, the likelihood is that you'll spend it. And so it, uh, somebody holding your salary for a month um, allows you to plan your life uh, better. Uh, data doesn't support it. Mm -hmm. If people were saving because of the salary being held, then American people would have been very rich by now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, would have, I would even argue with you that um, uh, it has nothing to do with there is a cost of waiting to get paid. There's a cost of, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, if I create scarcity of something in your life, anything, it creates a certain inner stress that is very hard to overcome. Mm. Uh, it's like, um, uh, should you eat when you are hungry? Or should you deprive yourself of eating when you're hungry? Animals eat when they're hungry, usually in the wild. Mm. They'll, they'll eat when they're hungry. Um, but human beings have these three gorgeous meals that they <laughs> eat. And um, it is not natural. Uh, this thesis that waiting to get paid allows you to build savings, data doesn't support it. Mm anywhere in the world. Uh, go back in history, armies used to go and uh, invade countries and soldiers were paid un not until the spoils of war were won. And they were just kept alive on the substance and things like that. I don't think it increased their um, uh, savings. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think, uh, I, I know that data doesn't support it. Uh, uh, and th that's why what we figured out is that we don't let people take more than one half of what they earn. Mm. So what we are trying to do is that you never get into the starvation mode, so to say, mm. and take the wrong decision. Uh, if people were, why do you think there are places with happy hours on Friday? Mostly why? people are paid on. Yeah, yeah, of course. They're paid. Why do you think there are more accidents on the roads when people get paid? There's a Swedish study which shows that. They get euphoric when they get paid. Huh. There's also a debate that uh, spousal abuse is greater. Um, sometimes people will get drunk the day they get paid. They'll yeah. be high. So spreading it out, I think there is enough evidence now that on demand, is better than controlled by uh, somebody else that you'll get paid on this day. Life isn't designed that way. Life is, you know, getting paid every month and bills getting coming every day is just that's don't align. That's right. Yeah. I, I just got another question here, and it also uh, might challenge things a slight little bit, but I often wonder if we forget about human psychology when we, when we do these sort of things. Like what is actually going to stop a person that already has bad habits with spending money from now getting it once a month um, to getting it more frequently from still spending it straight away? Like they would. They would. If we could prove that by holding their salary, we've made their lives better if we could prove that somehow that has increased their savings or has improved the quality of life, my argument is we don't pay them enough to hold their salary. Mm -hmm. If you were paying them enough that at the end of the month, the money that they made allowed them to save, say, 5% or 10%. They were paid enough that they could save 5 or 10%, but they're not paid enough. The market that I serve, they're just not paid enough. Mm -hmm. But I could go blue in my face trying to raise people's wages. I wouldn't have solved anything. It's not going to change because I'm saying it. We are not paying people enough. We don't pay them a living wage. Hmm. We keep them alive like 
at a slightly lower rate than what it should be. And then little episodes in their lives, a little tiny financial shock set them back even further. They're literally living on the edge most of the time. And in that uh, environment, I'm saying that until you guys figure out what needs to be done, I'm here to let them access what is rightfully there. Because another point that I would like to make very clearly that my work and what we are doing is we're letting them access what they've already earned. It's sitting with the employer. Like why do the poorest people need to give a two week loan to their employer? Why? Mm. Yeah, it's I mean, true. Have you thought about it? We constructed a society we went away from the kingdoms and now we've created corporations. Why does IBM need a 30 day loan from all its employees? Yeah. So true. Eh? Did Gareth right. ever go and buy an IBM of a Lenovo ThinkPad and not pay for it right then and there? They got their money, mm. but the people that are suffering in an organization, even if there are 10 of them out of a hundred, isn't it the corporation's responsibility to at least have some program in the company that is available, which is dignified in the confines of maybe a, an office you could go to and say, you know, this is a challenge that I have. And uh, whatever happened, my car broke down, my mother fell and I had to pay the bill or I fell or my wife fell or my whatever. And um, I need to be able to access my salary a little faster. I'm not saying to give me future pay. I'm mm. just saying that whatever I've heard and earned until the fifth of the month, if I need two days of salary, please let me have it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's also like an incentive there to want to work. If you know, like I'm, I can access that money, I'm going to be like, I need something for my mom or like you say, whatever the example is. And I might put in just a few more hours because I know that like I can actually access some of that. Uh, exactly. It's a ventilation money. system. It's like, for instance, um, have you ever left home without any money? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? It's very stressful, right? You have to ask somebody, hey, dude, can you give me 10 bucks? Now think, yeah. <laughs> if you left money at your home without any money and you couldn't ask anyone, yeah. that would become a pretty uh, difficult situation. But I'm talking about hardworking, good people. And they are experiencing these kinds of issues because A, they don't earn enough. B, when they need money, there is an alternative industry of payday loans, et cetera, which in America is they get hit by overdraft. They pay late fees. They are charged by the bank. I don't know if you know that. If your balance is below 1000 or 1500 you pay the bank $5 a month. So they are losing close to $200 a month in these timing related dings. And I'm saying that they shouldn't have to pay extra. It shouldn't be more expensive to be poor. It should be, it should cost the same. Yes. So that is where this whole thing comes in that to keep people uh, functional and uh, sane and, it's kind of necessary they get whatever. If they can't have steak every day, let them please have rice every day. Mm. Mm. Yeah, oh, it's, su it's super interesting and it's a really, really great idea. Um, but just moving on a little bit as well, it's, uh, you know, you have a great story and you've, you've learned so much throughout your life and you've actually you got a book coming out now called It's About Time. What sort of prompted you to want to write this book and what is it about? This journey, uh, the two, three years of retirement and then starting Pay Active almost five years ago, five and a, five and a half years ago, uh, has changed me completely as a human being. It's a reset of my life. As I said, all that I planned that I would do, I had done seems almost crazy to think like that or to say that I have no, I had no purpose. Hmm. Hmm. So when, so it's like I was born again hmm. and I found every interest, every hobby, everything that I need, I had to rediscover everything. 
in this rediscovery, I almost had to go and index myself. And it's like I had to take, go into my head and say, who am I? What has made me who I am? In that, this whole, this book is an outcome of that. And this, actually, I've got a copy here. So mm -hmm. it's coming out. And, and it's, it's, it's not a, it's not like, it's not going to be a bestseller or anything. But it's the most original and most honest reflection of what I could put together. Uh, and it's hard. That it's about time is really about who I am now. I believe that businesses have a responsibility towards this planet. I believe that governments are poor and businesses are rich. I believe that every CEO has a responsibility to this planet. And I'm not saying it in a sort of socialist, left-wing, whatever. I'm not, I'm not giving any lecture to anyone. I'm just saying that we have a responsibility towards people uh, that work for us. And since it's targeted towards business, it's about time that businesses took their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Remember, who's the, who, who are the that one or two or three trillion dollar companies in the US, I think almost trillion dollars, Amazon, Apple, and Google. When in history has a company been worth that amount of money? Mm -hmm. There is a $21 trillion debt on the US economy. Mm -hmm. U.S. owes 21, that debt is $21 trillion. We have this whole new financially engineered world where the size of Alibaba, the size of these companies is amazing, never in history. Maybe the last greatest empire, East India Company, had this much money. They used <laughs> to own countries, right? East India yeah. Company owned, owned India, owned uh, even America, I think, at one point. So these were the biggest uh, players. I mean, look, the, the, the original companies that came to uh, South Africa, those were the, yeah. uh, the Dutch. And Dutch. Uh, so those were the biggest companies. Today's equivalent are the Googles, Apples, Facebooks, um, Alibaba and Tencent, and these are the companies. Now, if they have close to a trillion dollars each, which is bigger than... 90% of the countries in this world, don't they have a responsibility towards everything? Hmm. Indeed. But don't all businesses then, even if of they're course, smaller? Of course, proportionally. Yeah. Proportionally. I mean, uh, if something's an ant, it is responsible for the, it's an ant, it has its proportional responsibility. If it's an elephant, it has its proportional responsibility. Mm. And the responsibility, I'm not saying that they should do anything, like pay more or whatever. But when you are the CEO of a company in a city which has a broken infrastructure and you are a trillion dollar company and it costs $2 billion to build a bridge or $1 billion to renovate the schools and the government doesn't have the money to do that, the corporations should be given, maybe the government should give incentives for them to participate because it increases the velocity of money in society. It allows participation. It, that's what I think. It, isn't the system broken though? Because you, you say that, okay, cool, Facebook, Amazon, um, and Apple, they must now say contribute more. But actually they are listed on the stock market, right? So the shareholders are going to go, no, 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 that's not what's going on here because we want our cut of the, the profits and the dividends. So you must give us that first. That's why we invested in you. And, you know, otherwise we're going to sell all of our shares. So it's not, it's not that clear cut, is it? Unfortunately. Well, why is it that uh, uh, the largest uh, fund in the world, uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink writes a letter to shareholders that make sure that you invest in those companies which are actually trying to do something, improve the lives of people. Today, yesterday, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, said exactly the same thing. Mm. And it is very, because there is no time left we have finally come to that point in our world's journey 
that if we don't do something about it, this automation-driven um, success that will create relentless profit without using more people, more expenditure, now these companies can grow even bigger because they are so automated, so good, so efficient that, that uh, it, is, it is almost counterproductive for them if they don't do something to improve the flock. Like for instance, Amazon has half a million people and uh, half of them make less than $35,000 a year or $15 an hour. And they raised it from something to $15 an hour. Mm. Now, how can it be that half their workforce is slightly above poverty? This is not capitalism. It is tomfoolery. Mm -hmm. You are hurting yourself. You're, it's like a tree cutting its own roots. This creates a virtuous circle, which will, and there's so much data. And, you know, conscious capitalism has produced it. And every analysis now studies, research studies, that those companies which are socially responsible and do the right thing, are more profitable, long-term sustainable. Hmm. The, the whole food story, which was acquired by Amazon, is amazing. The Patagonia story, hmm. the, 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 the success of the guy who did Chobani yogurt, hmm. the fastest to grow to a billion dollars in like five years, this guy in America made this Greek yogurt and multi-billion dollar company. And uh, what did he do? He treats his employees as owners. He gave everyone, uh, I mean, this is a whole new paradigm, but it is the oldest paradigm. Yeah. Do not hurt people. Mm -hmm. Do not mm -hmm. be aware of the unintended consequences. Yeah. So true. I, I it's used, not rocket yeah, science, hey? yeah, exactly. I used to I used to be an investment banker, and you know, each quarter you would sit and you'd listen to the COOs and whatever give you this amazing talk in the auditorium and blah blah. And they and every single time at this particular bank, the the guy that was at the the the, the helm, he would say the most important thing about this business is our customers. And every time I would sit there and I'd go, but you've got it so wrong. The most important thing about this is your employees. Yep. And yeah, you know, it's so great that there's people like you that are doing this and the guy Chobani that are, that are changing that mindset and understanding who the important people are because that needs to change. Businesses need to need to really I mean, it's, it's necessary off. it is necessary uh, you know the, 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 it is necessary now uh, it, if we don't do that uh, we won't be able to I think there'll be so much so many people will be left behind that we will have to figure out what to do with those people because the fear is and this is the sort of doomsday fear but it could happen that the people that will be left behind will be so far their brains will evolve differently for the next hundred years because they will be so uh, their children will go to different schools their anger will lead to all kinds so there will be first time there will be a bifurcation in society and it would be irreversible hmm. because if we don't do something about this inequality and things like that. We have to be sensitive to these things. You can't keep a you know, few hundred million people of the world left behind. It's dangerous. It's bad strategy. Hmm. Yeah. And so far, I, I don't want to get into that now too much, but is, is that something to the effect of UBI or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely it's been a, tried out. It could be, but uh, I think that in the, in the realm of U.S. capitalism, there has to be more creative solutions. UBI may work. We've 
there are a lot of research going on, there are trials going on. Most of the, some of the trials have been stopped. The results were not very good because human beings are also very individual and very, um, mm. the way I would say it is that if something caps your potential, we don't like it. Mm. UBI in some ways says that it should be done like in a country like America, just having free health care is like UBI because everyone's, there's no free health care in America. So you, everybody has to spend something for, in fact, the most bankruptcies in America are related to health care costs of people oh, wow. because there is no insurance or the insurance is not enough and they end up. Um, so UBI could be a solution. I'm not particularly, you know, neither opposed or I think try it try it in some tests and we'll find out. I feel that human beings need to be given fair opportunity. It's not about having money as much as it about opportunity. And I think for the first time, the distribution of opportunity, that balance has gone bad. Mm. The opportunity that was available, like literally in certain states, there are not enough jobs, so people don't get an opportunity. And if they don't leave the state, they can't get successful. It's like, take my example. If I hadn't come from a different part of the world to this country, if I had stayed back there, likelihood is the opportunities would be very different. It's kind mm -hmm. of unfair, right? I, and yeah. here, America gave me an opportunity. If I had stayed, uh, like you could say one day that if I had, if today I you know, fly back to, I go to London or to New York and go back into investment banking, I would be, but you have opportunity where you are, presumably. If there mm -hmm. was no opportunity, it becomes dangerous. I think part of our goal is to have equal opportunity for people, or at least as close to equal. Everyone should have the opportunity to succeed. UBI is one way to kind of keep, uh, it's like, um, you know what the babies have? It's like a pacifier. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if it is going to work in the long term. I think people need, people are amazing. They just need to be given the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's maybe kind of what you were talking about earlier is it's, it's maybe a step in the right direction of trying for something that needs to change. There's a yeah. purpose there, but maybe there'll be a better way along the way that we'll figure out and, Maybe it's I, mean, a start. I would frame it if somebody asked me that, how would you frame this? And I would say, first, we have to decide, do we care for human beings equally? If we make this as the goal, that my job is that humanity, if I see, you know, this is something I learned from somebody, somebody I admire a lot, that uh, maybe it's not possible for us to un end suffering in this world, but at least we can try to end the needless suffering. Mm -hmm. so to me, that, that little nuance, some of like my work is all I'm trying to say is the needless stuff you need not do. I mean, some guys messed up that I can't solve, but the 90% are not messed up. Yeah. yeah. Mm. They are victims of circumstances. Little thing happened here, 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 and now they're left into this dire strait. Mm. So I think uh, needless suffering, our goal should be that we should not allow needless suffering anywhere. And governments are poor. Governments are sometimes slot-like, can't move fast enough. But businesses are clever. They're nimble. They're automated. They have the latest and greatest technology. 30 years ago, the greatest technology was with the governments and the corporations used to use the supercomputers ran with the governments. Mm -hmm. Today, the governments have to go to corporations to get all kinds of resources. Mm. There's a, there's a change, right? We all, we know that. It's happened. So why not go to the ones that hold the power? Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Super fascinating. Uh, it's been such a great chat. Seriously, it's uh, he, he's such an inspiring and interesting man. Um, but just before we, we finish off, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what the sort of future's got in store for you and if people want to get in touch uh, with you, how they can you know, find out. And... I mean, like, uh, sadly, there is no place to hide. Uh, we live on the 
<laughs> World Wide Web. <laughs> I, I can be found on um, in many places, uh, the usual ones, uh, LinkedIn. I am not much of a tweeter. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I have a Twitter account. I'm Safwan Shah on Twitter. And um, my, my, uh, my business or my company, and um, that is PayActive. It's without an E, P-A-Y-A-C-T-I-V dot com. And you can read there. The, um, the book is coming out end of April. It's called It's About Time. There's a website for it, uh, which will come up. It's about time dot I-O. And uh, I couldn't find it's about time.com, so it's io <laughs> and, and dot book when the domain name is released. It's, it's pre ordered. Um, that's the easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, and uh, in terms of the future, anything? The future is amazing. <laughs> the future is amazing because I have a purpose to my dying breath, and that is to. I have found my purpose. So, you know, what I didn't have when I was a teenager, I found after retiring once. So my, <laughs> I'll be doing the same thing for the next 20 years. Hopefully pay active will be a long, uh, you know, will be, a, have this long life and uh, I'll continue to do it and continue to grow. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. in any case, that's what I will be doing. Uh, I want to, figure out a way to alleviate um, financial stress on a global scale uh, for billions of people. If I can't do it myself, I'll teach others to do it. Mm. Awesome. It's that spirit. We, yeah. I'm rooting for you. That's it's super inspirational. That's for sure. And, uh, you know, as Gareth said, we are unfortunately coming to the end of the chat and uh, your, your, one, your precious time. But before we do, we always have a question that we ask all of our wonderful guests. And the question is, what does it mean to you to be ridiculously human, Safwan? I, th I thought a lot about it. Um, I don't know why, because your title is Ridiculously Human. And I think to, to accept and embrace your weaknesses. And uh, my weaknesses I now know to some extent, like I love B-grade movies. <laughs> 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 I, I am never going, I'm never going to now. I just love them. I, you know, you, you put me on. Um, I love plane rides because they usually have a lot of B-grade movies in planes. <laughs> That's what makes um, to follow your heart is what makes you ridiculously human for you know. me, and to be free to have the freedom to do that that is the most beautiful thing in life. And I think I feel that I'm at that point in my life that I do what I love. And I'm not afraid of, you know, crying or smiling or just doing my thing. That's, that is human. I hope it wasn't ridiculously human. That is human. <laughs> but we th I think it's ridiculously human. Most people don't do that. Yeah. yeah. So true. It's so true that we, we tend to, just uh, put up this specific thing that we or front that we expect that we should sort of play up to and, and it's not always and we, do, do, we don't realize it Craig that we are what we hide mm. yeah it's, true. Only we, it's only that we don't know it but we are what we hide mm. yeah. yeah I like that <laughs> well said <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well listen uh, sorry guys yeah, no, I was just going to say uh, thanks uh, for coming on the show. Like it's, uh, it's been such an incredible chat, seriously, Safwan. Like you, you're such, a, I want to say inspirational, but it's, it's deeper than that. The, you, you, you are a real human that has gone through such an interesting life, like so varied, you know, and, and the cool thing which I think is so important is like you come from really humble beginnings and you've obviously had great leaders as parents and, and brothers and sisters and grandparents and stuff. But, but to, you know, I think coming from um, Pakistan and growing up in, in the country um, like that, which is like similar to us growing up in South Africa and then going to America and experiencing and doing everything that you did is, um, you know, has given you this sort of, different outlook and perspective on life and 
just hearing that was awesome, but also just hearing your outlook on life and also just what you are doing now is really amazing for humankind. And we need more people like you in this world um, to sort of challenge the way that we do things and challenge the way that we think and give a different perspective um, and care more like you, you care. And that is so important. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I felt this real connection with you. Um, as I said earlier on, like on another level and I really hope that at some point in the future we, we get to connect again, like in person and, and have a, have another Absolutely. great chat like this. Um, so I would love thank, to, I would love to. Thank you so much for your time and, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing so much wisdom and, um, yeah, just giving us a lot to think about. So really, really appreciate for you. No, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Craig. And uh, wishing you all the best. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll just keep it real brief. And, you know, I can't echo strongly enough what Gareth said. And uh, you give us a message of hope. This is the thing we don't always have enough of. Enough of. There are people out there that are caring, that are moving forward with the right attitude and the right mindset to actually spread a good message and then also stimulate something in others to maybe want to do the same. And I think that's a real skill and a real um, blessing to have in you. And, I, and maybe you don't even realize that you have that. Maybe you do, but it's a real great thing that you have about you is that when you finish talking to you, like, I can't wait to think what I could maybe do maybe do just a little bit different in my day to maybe just give back a little bit. And you mentioned the word curiosity earlier, and it's something we speak about a lot. It's just being curious of other people taking that time to think, how can I just care more and do more for them is a, is a real um, thing that more people can just do to make the world a better place. So you're doing it in a, in a massive way and on a big scale. So we can't thank you enough. And, and thanks for sharing your, your great uh, interesting story and uh, we look forward to connecting again that's for sure so thanks for my side too thank you very much thank you cool. good luck in the world cup how did you how did you enjoy the chat by the way out of interest i really enjoyed it i think the fact that you had done a lot of homework and uh, there's so much to talk about that, yeah uh, yeah and, you know, there were so many parts that uh, and i hope people find something or the other you know, for me, the Pakistan part of my life is not as exciting as sometimes for the rest world. It is, oh, wow, this guy came. Yeah, the, you know, yeah but it's fascinating. It's fascinating. <laughs> I love that part of the chat, like really. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And also, it's, it's, you mentioned it earlier, writing it down. But for us, we, we got into doing this almost by the idea of documenting history, you know, and and that's kind of what you're doing by, by, by being a first-hand account of what's happening on the ground in the country. You know, that's, that's valuable stuff, you know. Well, it's, uh, it's, you know I never thought of it that way, but uh, it's, 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 all, it's all good. I just hope that, um, you know, it, it, that it's useful. That it's useful yeah. for others. Definitely. It, it was a great chat. It's really, I, I feel like super inspired. So thank yeah, you. Like so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, so thanks thank again. You have so a much. wonderful have evening. Thanks again. Um, and we wish you a wonderful rest tonight. Okay. Thank you. It's 11, 11 PM. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take, take care, care man. Bye -bye. See you later. Thank you. Bye. 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 Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. Gotta be quick.